So now, um, my camera is blinking. One second, let me reconnect it and connect again. Strange. So. Yeah, no, it's working. Perfect. So the, today our topic is a CNN for neural networks. And let's recapitulate a bit on the things that we discussed in our previous session, where we're saying, what is what are the things that motivate research in a neural networks for time series. And we say one thing is that we want to consider long sequences. We want to be able to forecast and uh, make use of, um, let's say like a seasonality or all patterns in, in our data. And uh, as we saw in uh, our previous seminar where we we're discussing about RNNs, this is actually non-trivial, right? So this is something where we believe that one of the benefits of the RNN is this recurrency that enables us to basically uh, consider a patterns in the data. And also we saw how uh, the LSTM, given that it has this uh, forget gate and also this, this memory cell, it is potentially better suited for uh, these longer sequences. But then also we saw our second point that happens a lot in the uh, research for neural forecasting. And it is that although we see very complex architectures appearing, including new things. Uh, very often what happens is that they're not necessarily better. Um, we see how, for example, using a very simple, so one a layer RNN, uh, so we can obtain similar results as those more complex architectures. And we're discussing why is that? And we realize basically what they're doing is they're just skipping um, so inputs. And this brings us now to our topic of today, which is CNNs for uh, time series data. And we discussed two ideas. One is WaveNet, and the other one is uh, quasi-recurrent neural networks. And we start with WaveNet. Uh, WaveNet is basically a publication that appeared in 2016, more or less. And uh, it was originally for a uh, voice data. And it was also a generative model. So the idea was to how to generate speech. Um, and here in this publication that we look at, they basically take this and use it for time series forecasting. So uh, we will look into how the original works, but not fully detailed because there are things that this other publication by uh, Boroki, they uh, make some modifications to make it work for a time series forecasting. And also more importantly, we'll see how we can use CNNs for a uh, time series uh, and so forecasting. And uh, the question would be for us, in, in the end, it seems that potentially CNNs, they, they, they do as well as um, so working with uh, RNNs or LSTM. So it will be, so is it potentially maybe more convenient to work with uh, CNNs than with RNNs, given that there are some benefits uh, with CNNs, we'll, we'll see all that. So let's get started. Yeah? So, and, and also here, we'll also review uh, a lot of ideas about CNNs and so on. So potentially you already know all them from so, so you're deep learning class, but maybe you didn't take the class, then this will be something for the first time. But also there are things that normally when we talk about CNNs, we talk about them in the context of uh, images or, or video and so on. Um, very rarely, so we discuss them in uh, so the context of sequential data. So maybe seeing this um, adaptation of CNNs uh, or the explanation of CNNs for sequential data will be also uh, good for you to uh, establish how, how it works. So what, what are they doing in this publication? So first is that they say, okay, let us take WaveNet and let us see how we can use it for time series forecasting. For this, of course, they cannot use it out of the box. So they have to make changes to make it work. And then on one side, they say, we replace uh, some uh, parts of the uh, original WaveNet with a ReLU activation function. So they, they basically say, uh, this is a simplification of the architecture. And it also is better suited for um, time series data instead of the original speech. And also not only that, but given that this is a bit simpler, then it's also faster for processing. Then they also say, let us try to evaluate different, um, so financial time series uh, data. So once I take uh, so stocks, they take the volatility index, they take so here uh, the, the CBO interest rate and also the multiple exchange rates. So in, in if we look for, at this publication from the side of the 
uh, benchmark that they're doing is also quite relevant uh, into how they're comparing because something that you will be seeing whenever you do any type of uh, research or, or a study on a time series forecast is often that uh, the, the methods that I compare, they include that they're not enough. Um, so the data sets or uh, these are adapted in such a way that makes them hard to compare. And here at least they, they try to use a broader set of, um, so here financial assets. And, and not only that, but also they go and compare them with uh, LSTMs and also uh, classical traditional uh, autoregressive models. So this way they show that uh, the convolutions, they are a good idea to use for, um, so time series forecasting. They also show that with the convolutions and more specifically the dilated convolutions that we'll be uh, looking at, they can also generate forecasts for a longer time series. And uh, the other benefit is also that um, we can also handle longer uh, sequences. And uh, given that we do not have the recurrency, it's easier to implement and also easier to compute, right? So, so it, it seems that here we have a, a very promising combination of we get good results, it is uh, easy that we prepare it, and also it is easy that uh, we compute it. So uh, let, let's see how it works. But the first question is why at all we should care for this, right? So uh, it, it is, um, there are so many problems on, on sequence data, so why, why they consider um, so financial time series. And financial time series is uh, quite interesting from a research perspective in that on one side, we have these uh, very noisy time sequences, but also if we think about the, the methods itself that uh, so are done for financial time series, there are some limitations historically. One is that on one side, um, they can consider these uh, long sequences. So uh, this applies pretty much to all forecasting methods, but more specifically for um, financial time series is that they have the characteristic traditionally that on shorter ranges, there is a lot of noise. So if you look, let's say at uh, intraday data, minute data and so on, they're very noisy. But then also on, on, on over longer periods or longer trends, they are a bit more stable. There are, there are frequency patterns. So uh, we have the challenge that we traditionally can only use short time periods, but actually, in order to extract information, we need these, these longer ones. And also, if we think about, so for forecasting methods, we want methods that are um, robust to noise. And given that the financial time series are, are quite noisy, then it becomes interesting into how we can develop methods that um, can work for this type of data. Yeah. And as you might well know, so time series forecasting for financial time series, it, it has a long history. So there are so many methods in literature, especially those that are um, so based on, uh, so either uh, auto regression or, or also uh, they might be um, focused on volatility and so on. So there are, there are whole books on forecasting for financial time series. Um, nevertheless, if we think about purely just fine, uh, neural forecasting, there's actually not, not that much. Uh, there, there is a still a very little compared to traditional methods. So this is making it interesting that we have a interesting sequences with unique characteristics. The literature is not so well developed on the neural forecasting side. And also um, we see that even though there are very few methods available, there are even less for those that consider CNNs. So here we see a nice combination of ideas that we can use for uh, develop something new. So, yeah, so, so we have here the, the noisiness, we have uh, the limited duration and, and so on, yeah, so. And then it's a question of, so wh why is CNN? Besides the fact that uh, we're saying the CNNs um, are attractive because not much has been done in the literature, so already it's a good criteria to do something uh, new as a research. The benefit of uh, using a CNN here for forecasting is that, and as we'll see more in detail, the CNN is basically a, a filter that we are uh, passing across the sequence. So basically we are um, reducing the uh, original sequence to let's say like, uh, so to say like a subsequence. And this allows us to basically apply transformations across uh, the, the sequence. And not only that, but also um, thanks to this filter, then we can recognize these patterns through the, through the data. Yeah. So uh, CNNs, um, although let's say at, at first glance, it, it might not sound 
as uh, the most intuitive idea to use for sequences is definitely something that has a lot of benefits. And uh, there have been some ideas already for forecasting with CNNs. So basically, some of the things that they use, for example, wavelet transforms, we'll see, although we'll not really discuss them, we'll quickly see that, in fact, wavelets are not that different or are very close to convolution. So or they're also like an another idea from filters. Wavelets uh, is, they, they come from signal processing and so on. So it's a very well-established entry in the literature. Uh, so working with wavelets. And we see that given that this is already something very well-established and CNNs or their say convolutions, they are similar to wavelets. We can get basically some ideas cross-pollinate from one on the other in order to use neural forecasting with CNNs there. And uh, yes, so um, why do we think that uh, so CNN for forecasting uh, so should work? And once we have this idea of the filters, we'll be passing. So uh, that way we will be able to uh, reduce the noisiness because we're simplifying our, our sequence, but also given that we can choose the size of the filter, then we can also make it so that we can consider these, these patterns, right? So we can let's say like amplify or a uh, so so to say simplify, yeah. So, mm. nevertheless, yeah, as, as we keep seeing in our in our so lecture and also everywhere in conferences, uh, if we think about neural forecasting, we primarily think about recurrent uh, methods, RNNs, LSTMs, GRUs. We saw it on the previous seminar. So this is basically the state of the art, and uh, in, in this work and in any other, you always need to compare with them as a baseline. Yeah? And uh, we were saying. Yes, but nevertheless, CNNs, they can be interesting and they might be even superior. Why they might be even superior to RNNs? There are a couple of ideas that make them superior. On one side, the, um, they are easier to, to train and to predict, given that in the end, it's only this filter. So this has a, this com the convolutional structure is something that is very, very simple to, to train and, and to implement, whereas the uh, RNNs and the LSTMs, they have more moving parts, so to say. We're looking last seminar on how an LSTM looks like. And we're looking at all these additional models that it has with the uh, flush and the memory cell and so on. So implementing them, they're challenging. Then also uh, we were discussing how the recurrency makes it possible or not makes it possible, rather the, it will be, it, it triggers this idea of the vanishing graph, right? So it's already something that, that we, we need to keep uh, constantly in our heads whenever we're working with RNNs. And uh, on the other side, so if we think about uh, the CNNs, so we're saying about this idea of the filter, then also we have on top the dilated convolutions, that this is uh, an additional idea or, or an additional uh, improvement over the uh, traditional convolution. So this will be, that we will be, let's say, uh, skipping uh, elements in our input in order to cover a, a, a in order to cover a larger subsequence in, in uh, our data. So we'll see how it works in a few minutes. So this idea of the dilated convolutions is basically what we're discussing in our last seminar with the one layer RNN is very, very close. And the, um, the benefit of using these dilated convolutions is that that way we'll be able to cover a broader range of history, but at a lower uh, computational uh, cost. Yeah, so um, then if we think about what inspires this, this work is basically on one side we have, a, a, so here a WaveNet that they take it as the starting point, but they improve it for, for a time series forecasting and especially multivariate time series forecasting for um, financial time series. And the things that they change, uh, we, we already mentioned that on one side they use a ReLU, so they uh, replace uh, the, some, some elements of the WaveNet with the ReLU. They make the model simpler and also they include uh, so skip connections. We'll also see in a few minutes what are skip connections. But in general, um, they uh, add additional things that, uh, so they support uh, working with the time, with financial time series. So if we summarize what are the contributions is that they were the first to say, let us take WaveNet and use it for time series forecasting. And also more specifically for financial time series. And not only that, but also they uh, evaluate. And so they this improvement over WaveNet with an LSTM and also the methods from the literature in order to use it for financial analysis forecasting. So they, they have all these data sets that they have. So it's quite comprehensive. And uh, they, they conclude that uh, the results are basically 
as good as recurrent methods or even better with the benefits of um, faster computational times and also a simpler implementation. And so uh, of course, all, always when we look at forecasting publications, always when um, we see results, we have to be very critical because everyone will claim that a method is the best. And uh, in practice, that might not be the case. But by now it's very well established that WaveNet is a, a very robust method for sequences in general. And if you look at um, just the uh, number of variations that have been done over the years for WaveNet, uh, there are hundreds of them. So not only for here sequences uh, or time series forecasting, but also for all type of uh, tasks in classification, forecasting, etc. So um, the idea of using um, convolutions, dynamic convolutions, is actually is in reality quite solid, and we'll also see how. Um, the quasi-recurrent neural networks that we'll see in our second segment, they share some similarities and they also show how working with CNNs is a, a good idea for a time series forecasting. So the results definitely are, can be considered as reliable and therefore this gives us a good, um, this, give, this motivates us to consider CNNs as a technique for time series forecasting. So let's look at more into detail. Let's start with the, so, a fresh, a refresher on things that we discussed on last seminar, but also you have seen so in machine learning class and, and also in, in other seminars and so on. And then, so first we start with just the feedforward neural network. And last seminar we were saying the feedforward neural network is actually just a linear combination of inputs that will be passing through a, a nonlinear activation function. So and here we can see it in, in our so animation here. So how we have. So some inputs, and then we'll have some weights, and uh, then we'll aggregate them and pass it to uh, our um, nonlinear activation function. And this is basically, um, this will be the, the main element in, in the feed forward. And then at, uh, at the end, so we have like, multiple layers. So we will have a, a final layer where we'll be computing the forecasted value. So um, here so far so good, there should be nothing new here, but this is basically starting point for a convolution. So um, this is where we start and the convolution is, uh, uh, we have been saying that this is a filter that we're applying. And we can see it in animation here on the right side where just imagine that the blue block is our sequence. You will be saying, oh, but how, I, I have a, a sequence that is a, a series, right? So it should be just like a long uh, one, one row, one column. How, how do I get this block? And you will see that in practice, what people do is they will split the sequence into subsequences and they will stack them. So you can think about, for example, um, if we're talking about here the topic of uh, financial time series forecasting, you might have, let's say, um, a year of data and then you will split it over, uh, let's say, weeks. So every row will be one week for a respective and so stock. So let's say, so like the Apple stock. And um, this way you can have in the end this matrix of um, all. Um, on the weeks for the Apple stock. And what the convolution is basically doing is that is, is a, so going through a segment that we define, going through a, a block that we find and scanning it, and then aggregating it basically. So this way out of a, a large input, we get a smaller output. So, and we see in fact that, um, so this uh, convolution is basically what we're having on, um, our feed forward, but now we're having this uh, filter that is moving, and um, we have this as a this basically this this product between um, this F and G that is um, just our, our so we're having like this this moving filter behind, right? And you may be saying so what, what things that happen often in intensive forecasting is that often we do not have sequences that are the same length. Or what happens if, for example, um, if we stay in, in our example of the um, of the weak forecast for the Apple stock? What happens if, for in some day, we do not have any observation because it turns out that this day is a bank holiday, so there are no open markets on that day, or also we have problems collecting it and we our time series incomplete. So that means that, uh, so here in this case, we have in each row five elements. What happens if in one row, we have only four elements? In those cases, then we will consider about uh, 
having a, a padding. So we'll be adding elements or we'll add a zero element so we can have it on the same size. I can see it so here uh, in how it looks for, we have see it on the right side. We see on one side how we have zero padding on the upper one and on the lower one we have so padding of one. And then the only thing that we did is that we added so like this frame, this border, these um, so gray elements. So, th so this way we can have sequences of the same size in, 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 our, in our input. Um, we can we can use padding. We do not need to use it, um, but nevertheless, the idea of padding so allows us to basically control the output size of the convolution. So we can decrease it, increase it, or keep the same, and so on. So this gives us flexibility. Um, but uh, talking specifically about time series forecasting, using padding is just a standard, um, even a transformation technique to be able to have sequences that can be used. Um, in our network, so they are all of the same size. And so, so then here we see this little animation that basically is just just the same, right? So, and and then we can see just that the, the convolution is just it's just a shift of the signal. So the signal G over the input F along J, and we're computing the way some of the two. And this is just the idea of convolution. So uh, here, uh, not nothing, nothing new for you, or should be nothing new. But if we think about um, what happens in the in the CNN architecture, then uh, this is just let's say like the generalization of, of the convolution. So we will have multiple layers, um, each node is connected to a local region in the input, and um, this is basically um, the receptive field of the node. Right? So. Mm, here, the difference between the uh, regular neural networks and the uh, convolution neural networks is that the value of the uh, feature map is shared same weights. Right? So uh, all the nodes in the output detect basically the, the same pattern. And um, another thing that we have is that here so far we're seeing just one layer. Here we're seeing like one dimensional um, or, or basically two dimensional in this case. So we're seeing it two dimensional object, but normally, so when we think about convolutional neural network, we're thinking about a three dimensional thing. So we normally there is a additional, and so the number of channels and in for images it's obvious, right? So here we'll say we have an, have an RGB, we'll try to convert this into pixels that is it will be of different colors. But what happens for sequences and for a time series? And normally, what happens here is that the channels we use them for, for example, um, for multivariate time series forecasting. So, in, in the case of um, in, in the case of uh, our uh, so here forecasting of uh, so the, our financial time series, one possibility is that we say, okay, we have like the Apple stock, but also we want to have uh, multiple transformations of the same uh, Apple stock, but also we can say, okay, we'll have another channel that consists of, uh, for example, a, a, a volatility index or so on. So uh, the, the channels that enable us to enrich our uh, so univariate sequence with uh, other sequences that are connected to the one that we have. And so um, if we think about uh, the, the projects that we're looking into uh, for uh, the class, there is this one on, on financial time series forecasting. And here the idea is that we have uh, resolutions of a financial time series on a minute level, hour level, and so on. And we want to forecast something that's a high resolution. And um, here, what one can think of is that we can use the number of channels in order to have these uh, different resolutions for the, uh, for, for the same sequence. So we can have one channel that is one hour level, another one that is on, on, a, on a, a, let's say, a daily level, and so on and so forth. So here there is a lot of things written, but just uh, to simplify, and of course you will have access to all these materials, so you can you can look into to it with more detail. But so what are here like the main takeaways is that if we look at uh, this, in fact we are not seeing that many differences with regards to uh, our uh, regular uh, neural network that uh, that we're discussing so far, so our for neural network, and um, Yet, at the same time, we can do um, 
we can use it for uh, so working with sequences. And here I have how it will look for a, a sentences, right? So in the case of uh, NLP, we can also use CNNs. In this case, they use it for classification. And this is what we're saying that, um, so we're putting our input, in this case, they're putting each word as a specific um, row of the input. And uh, the idea is that out of these, we'll create, we'll use a convolution to, to reduce this input in something smaller. And at the end, we'll have a, a fully connected layer and we'll basically use here in this case softmax in order to do the classification. So and we see here that both for NLP as well as for time series, we can use CNNs. And, and in fact, the architectures, they do not differ that much. And the other thing that we can also see is that we can control the size of this filter. And this as a filter will also be relevant into what we can capture. So, yeah. Then, um, yeah, and then here you can see this uh, comparison between a feed forward neural network with three layers and uh, so the, the convolutional one. And uh, well, we see here like the obvious things that the feed forward will be, uh, will have connections uh, across all the different layers, whereas uh, the convolutional one it differs in that um, it does not share. So here uh, the weights across. So if we go back to our um, our problem with the time series forecasting and for this specific architecture, then how, how else does it differ? In that um, we have on, on one side these um, one dimensional time series that we want to predict. So we want to maximize the likelihood of function. And in the case uh, of uh, this publication, so how they want to maximize the likelihood function is through WaveNet. So, so, and then in WaveNet, the main idea is uh, using stacks of delayed convolutions. And what are, what are dilations? And we can see here nicely exemplified with a image. So the idea of dilations, it is that we keep this a filter that will be moving across our input, but you can see that we skip some inputs as we move along through the, the input itself. So we can see how this way we can uh, capture a, a broader range in our sequence while keeping the output constant. And uh, le let's remember that also we say in our last seminar, I see I, there is some things in the chat. Um, so there is one question. So for multivariate, how do we prepare data like this? Different variables in different channels or what? Uh, yes, exactly. So normally, so what we consider is that we'll have a, a, in the different channels, the different variables, exactly that. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the, the case. Mm. And then, so, so going back to our topic of here, the relations, and we were saying in our previous seminar that another major motivator behind working with a time series and neural forecasting is that in time series, we have these, uh, inputs that are varying length, but we want to have a, a, we want to fix it somehow so we can always have the same size for our output. And it, with the relations we have basically this in that on one side, we can have this fixed size, although we can, uh, so by playing with the filter um, and this way, uh, not only we keep this size, but also we can consider a, a broader range in the time series itself. So, and, if you will look at our previous uh, seminar uh, with the one uh, RNN, and let me try to open it to, so we can refresh it quickly. So there we're also saying that um, we, we have basically the, the same thing where we're skipping. So it is here. One second, I just want to bring it up quickly so we can, in case that, Here, this. So, if we recall here what Turek was proposing, we see how, so he was basically suggesting, let's have this delayed RNN where we're skipping inputs. And uh, this is basically the same thing as what is happening with the uh, dilated convolutions in that also we're skipping the inputs across the filter. Um, a benefit of, um, using the dilated convolutions over the, uh, this uh, delayed RNN, it is that given that we stack it and uh, we can see it here. 
So given that we stack these dilations, as we see in this uh, image here, I will um, increase it. We can be much flexible in um, the this filter. So how, how many um, how many observations we'll be skipping, how large it should be, and also we can stack it as much as we want. So um, this gives us a lot of flexibility compared to uh, what Rick was proposing. But the idea is very close in that. Uh, so in both cases, what we want is uh, we want to cover longer sequences by uh, skipping inputs in those longer sequences. So uh, in for, for uh, this uh, architecture I proposed, the, the idea is the following. So let, let us basically take a, a time series. Let us then have a multiple layers where initially we we'll have the dilated convolution. So we'll have this moving filter where we'll be skipping things. And also we'll have, of course, non-linearities, right? So this is standard and this will generate a, a feature map. And then a, we'll have the delay convolution followed by a regular convolution. The idea is that we want to reduce, so they want to make it more compact and a, so obtain a one-dimensional vector. And the, the main objective is to obtain subsequent values of, of, the, of the series. Um, so, um, we can see also here that uh, one essential point in the dilated convolutions is uh, this, uh, the receptive field. And uh, the receptive field is, uh, so the, the number of uh, neurons that will be uh, in, in an, uh, as, as the input, right? So here we have our input that it has, uh, so eight. So this receptive field is of size eight. And to compute, we can use here, this one here. Yeah. Mm. Then um, here, there are also a couple of things that we need to, to consider in that um, on one side, uh, we want only to, uh, so when we predict, we and this is a, a regular problem that we have in, uh, so for neural forecasting, it is uh, looking into the future in that, um, we are going through, we are going through through a filter. Yeah, so so we're going, we're moving the filter along, and um, this is all of the same size. Uh, and what happens so for training, uh, when we want to forecast the last value, so for our training set, uh, although here we are already observing it by moving our filter along, um, so we have the challenge that of course we should not be peeking into the future. But given the nature of how the convolution and the dilation behaves, we, we have this risk of um, looking into it. And also, when we'll see next week, I believe, when we we'll start discussing transformers, transformers is also an essential topic in, in uh, how we can um, avoid looking into the, into the future. In transformers, they use basically a, a, a mask matrix of, of zeros and so on that, um, in order to obfuscate it or Zeros or or, infinity or very small values uh, that, they, that the one puts. Um, and in the case of here, uh, for the dilated uh, convolutions, what they do is they just pad with vectors of zeros. So what, again, the, the idea is that we want um, to be able to forecast, uh, but we do not want that during the training, we are looking into things that we should be forecasting. So then we'll be padding it uh, so with zeros. Uh, so that way we do not look into, into it. So, mm. And then um, what happens at this time is that, uh, so we'll be forecasting one step ahead. So that means that this uh, architecture has an element of autoregression. So it is so autoregressiveness because what happens is that when we want to forecast ahead in time, then um, the, for, the predictions will be fed as part of the input in order to forecast the next value, right? So here we see that in order to forecast, so here the uh, uh, x hat at the point t plus two, this is basically using um, the prediction that was previously, plus of course the other inputs from real values. So, so the interesting thing also here from, uh, so with the CNS is that this is, um, this brings us closer to the classic methods that we're using in, for time series forecasting. Um, and not only make it comparable, but also here this way we can later for research and for new things, we can introduce ideas that come from ARMA models and so on, right? So, um, yeah. 
then how how what is the objective function here to learn is that here they just uh, use a mean absolute square error and they um, decide to regularize it with the L2. So here we can see here how we have uh, our uh, we have our uh, mean, mean absolute error with the L2 regularization, where uh, so we have this this uh, gamma as the regularization term, and uh, of course these have the nodes uh, so our forecast. Um, so the idea here is that we do not want to have two large weights, and as we know with the delta regularization, we'll basically so shrink the weights. We we'll have small weights. We will not eliminate completely. We'll, it'll, they will become small. So this is a, also here we can see that this is like a rather standard objective function. So often we see in research for neural forecasting that they use um, more esoteric or more very tailored uh, objective functions, so, so cost functions. And uh, in this case here, uh, this is, yeah, so, so there's nothing special here, right? So, so we have seen this uh, in, in our machine learning class and in, in many other contexts. Uh, so this, this type of uh, function. Also the authors, they, they draw basically some comparisons. They say that they, they, there is a little bit of, a, so here, um, a, so Bayesian ideas behind um, in, in how the uh, cost function is minimized. So through posterior distribution. And um, then so for, for optimizing, yeah. So here what they say is we, we use back propagation. So here this, this is also standard and I don't think you knew for, for any of you. They, they make a, a small modification in that they use a Adam gradient descent. So uh, the idea is that, uh, so they want to learn adaptively the uh, learning rates and uh, they have want to have this decaying, um, and so exponentially decaying average. Um, but otherwise, this will be also pretty much standard. And I would say that also the idea of using Adam Grand descent is more uh, something that came through trial and error. Uh, I will not say that uh, this was designed from the beginning from so for some specific uh, theoretical benefits, just that they try multiple ways how they can uh, so, so learn uh, the weights better, and it turns out that it gave it better results. And then for the activation function, they use a, a, a ReLU. And so ReLU also, you should know it from. Um, the uh, deep learning class. Um, in the original WaveNet is not used ReLU. Um, they, they say that they get better results. Probably here is also similar where they were trying multiple options and turns out that ReLU was the, the same. Uh, here again, so for anyone working with, uh, so neural forecasting and, and developing new methods, in reality what happens is that most of the time one tries to try multiple things and um, we don't really know what will happen. And likely this will happen here also that they, they, they say it gives better results, but definitely there is no theoretical justification why it was the case. Um, probably in their experiments, it turned out that it just keeps the better results. And then the question is how, how do they initialize the, the weights here? Um, well, they basically have here a, 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 an initialization where they have a, this, this variance. Um, and um, this is something that they took it from a different uh, publication. Mm, here, again, another so thing that one sees a lot for neural forecasting is that uh, often there are a lot of tricks and best practices that are disseminated across the literature. So um, here again, it's a, a thing of trial and error on what works best. And in this case, they, they decide to go for this initialization. Um, Then um, there's a the topic of, uh, so, so the skip corrections in that, uh, so the idea is that we have all this stack of dilated convolutions, but the problem is that as we're adding some of these more layers, then uh, we are uh, ha we, we are having a potential degradation. You know, and how, how can one address this? Well, they say, okay, let us use, uh, so these uh, residual connections or skip connections. Um, and uh, so just the idea is that, so for some, um, for some layers, we'll be just skipping. Um, so, so, so we're just skipping. So what happens one layer into the, the next? Uh, and this again is like another trick where um, one is to just try it and see if it works. Um, in this case, it, it works nicely for them. And the benefit of just trying, so here's skip connections is that that way they can stack more. So, and then we're saying, and then we go back to the representation here above. We're saying where 
working with very long sequences or we want to work with very long sequences. And as a result, likely we'll have a lot of so layers in order to be able to stack them and cover this very long sequence. So that means that almost necessarily we'll need to be using something such as uh, so skip connections or, or any other things that uh, help us deal with uh, this very uh, deep network. So let's continue. Mm -hmm. There, as I was saying, that um, the the authors also they said, okay, what we're doing is very close to a discrete wavelet transform, and a discrete wavelet transforms is just uh, the idea that we have a signal and then we want to transform it into smaller signals that represent uh, different segments in our original signal, and um, the, this transformation is very close to, to CNN. So, so here, also if we look at the literature that, uh, or time series forecasting with neural methods, there are quite some that also take a um, Fourier transform, well transform and so on as a, as a filter for uh, the uh, neural network. And, and, and this is not only so for CNN, it's also uh, there these days there's a lot with transformers and so on that they combine so with um, so the, these ideas from signal processing. Um, but basically here they say the uh, discrete wave transform is very, very close to what we're doing. And this is also a justification of why this works because we know that the wave transform works quite well as a way to basically summarize, as a way to abstract good representations of a, a sequence. And what we're doing is nothing else than just that. However, there's a difference between um, the Fourier transform and the discrete, uh, so this discrete wavelets and uh, these dynamic convolutions, in that in, in the in this discrete wavelet transform we're fixing uh, the, the the filter, so we cannot uh, so adjust it as we can do it with dilations. So they say yes, it is similar, but we're much more flexible with our uh, dilated convolution approach. So in theory, this should enable for uh, making it better. Then there's the topic of uh, so conditioning. Mm -hmm. And here the main takeaway is that, uh, so basically they, they're using a, a ReLU. So, so the, the, the idea is, okay, we want to maximize uh, this uh, conditional likelihood. And um, then, uh, so they, they, they use the, this ReLU and then they have a, a, a resulting field. And um, the nice thing also about uh, so what they're proposing is that uh, this conditioning it is uh, it works for both the multivariate as well as the as a univariate uh, time series. So the and another benefit let's say from this publication that is worth highlighting is that often you will see that many publications uh, for neural forecasting they can only do one thing. Uh, so either they are for multivariate time series or they are for univariate. Not so often we see uh, architectures and methods that can be adjusted for both cases. And in, in this case, uh, so here with WaveNet or um, so tensile forecasting, uh, it is, uh, is possible. So it's another benefit that it makes it uh, more robust and flexible for uh, real life cases. Mm. Yeah, so then how it looks, we have discussed like a lot, a lot of things, but how, how it looks in practice, right? So. So what will be the architecture, how, how it looks is that we have, um, we can see how we have the, the dilated convolutions and we're saying we have the, uh, this dilation followed by a, a nonlinear activation. And then they have this residual connection. And so we're saying this is like a skip. Uh, so in order to avoid the problem that um, given that we're having all these stacked layers and that we're still having problems with our architecture. And then uh, the, uh, for the output layer, so we'll have this uh, so very small convolution in order to forecast, right? So um, we see how, although we have discussed like a lot of things uh, for our architecture, in fact, it is very straightforward. We're just having, so this uh, dilation followed by the ReLU, then we have these key connections, and then we move to uh, the, the next layer, right? So uh, it is very straightforward. And then, so go quickly through through experiments. So they just say, okay, we use an artificial uh, so time series that we're generating, and then um, 
also we have the financial market and um, they also propose with uh, two different versions of uh, the, the architecture. So one is uh, more the classical one and the other one is the one that is here conditioned. And so here you can see that, uh, yeah. So in, in practice with these uh, synthetic data sets and so on, they, they get very good results and so on. And then if we think about um, how to work with financial data, this is also another thing that's worth interesting. Uh, that's interesting to, to look at if you are interested in, so like financial forecasting, one of the challenges is um, how do we uh, evaluate uh, the, our results and primarily, so how, how do we transform it? Because normally working with sequences and time series involves normalizing the, the series somehow. Never we just put, or, or clock almost never, very rarely, we put raw inputs into our architecture in order to do something. Normally we try to do some normalization for it. And in this case, they decide to use uh, the returns. And so they, they, they look at the returns all, all over a, a certain period. So that way they are transforming it. And then they, they normalize the returns. Um, so, and to evaluate how good this was as, as a forecast, they use a maze that is also a very standard function to assess how good a prediction was with regards to the original um, so or the original value um, and uh, they uh, have over multiple years so this is like another thing to consider in the how we're evaluating um, looking at uh, the experiment setting is always interesting in the articles in that in this case they said okay we'll have multiple periods they said from 2008 2010 then 2011 2013 and so on so they have two years period and in order to evaluate because uh, we know that um, for a time series forecasting, we cannot use the classical uh, methods from um, machine learning in cross-validation and so on. Here, that does not work because uh, we know that we, we uh, should be very careful on uh, the hierarchy of uh, the sequence. Right, so we cannot say, okay, we'll use the year of 2010 in order to predict 2009 and so on, because 2010 is dependent of 2009. And, and therefore here, what they use is they take, uh, so there are multiple techniques what we can use, but in this case, what they say is you'll split our full sequence into blocks of two years, and we'll have uh, these two years, and or probably, um, so one part will be for train and, and let's say like 70%, and the 30% will be for, for test, and then we take the next two years and so on, right? And they, they, they also benchmark with LSTMs, et cetera. And in the end, yeah, so they, they show here uh, that they, we can see that, um, that they have also these classical methods and so on. Mm. And we can see how uh, they, they get um, so results that they seem to be uh, quite good. Uh, considering also that uh, this is a, a archi these are CNNs and we, should, we will be thinking that CNNs are not the best architecture for sequences and so on. So taking all things accounted, the results are uh, very solid. Mm. And yeah, so mm, basically con concluding, so here, this is a, a word that has a lot of things. So it's a very long article. So it's like 22 pages and it has a lot of things to consider, but what, what is it about? It's about saying, let us take convolutions as a way to do forecasting. And the nice thing of convolutions, if we go back to the beginning, is that we have this filter that enables us to um, go through um, our sequence and, and simplify it will make it a more compact representation. On top, if we consider the dilations, this way we can consider longer sequences. We are no longer limited by the size of the sequence. And given that the dilations, we can stack them and use skip connections to avoid problems with stacking, uh, we can this way have a long sequence into account. And because we can use the channels, then also we can this way consider a multivariate uh, time time series. So we see all these benefits, plus on top the fact that uh, we can also use our prediction in order to forecast the next uh, value. So uh, we have this autoregression form. We have therefore a method that is, um, it gives good results, it is simple, and also um, is based on a lot of existing literature. So it has already a, a lot of benefit, let's say from a pure, um, methodical standpoint, but also we're seeing how the results are 
as good as an LSTM. And although here they do not show uh, times for computation, it's very well documented that um, training CNNs is faster than training an LSTM. So if we think about uh, some millions of time series, if we're having millions of time series, and if we think of something such as Amazon, Amazon has millions of products, and then we want to forecast its sales for these millions of products, and with an LSTM, this will be uh, computationally expensive and also will slow, whereas an L a CNN can be significantly faster. So we're seeing all these benefits that they're having, mm. and mm, you might be asking yourself, okay, so everything sounds perfect, so why is not everyone using CNNs? And um, as we'll be seeing in, in our next uh, segment, there are some limitations uh, to, to them. So they, they are uh, something that is uh, that makes them, for some cases, not as convenient. And also, uh, compared to transformers, they are not that good for uh, very long sequences. Transformers are even better for very long sequences. And here, if we think about, let's say, um, thousands of observations or more than thousands of observations and so on, this is where we might be experiencing a problem because let's remember how we're happening. Um, so with the, what we're doing is we're having this um, hierarchical stacking where we're skipping the observations, right? So we're doing this, this stacking here. And that means that um, the number of layers is proportional to uh, the, the length of the hour. Uh, sequence, right? So if we have a very long one, we have a very uh, so dense model. And uh, we know in general from our uh, deep learning class and also from experience that uh, very dense models bring a lot of challenges with them, right? So how, how we can uh, avoid um, training problems, how we can uh, optimize them and so on and so forth. So therefore that means that, although this is a very nice idea and uh, definitely something, uh, so we're developing, there is, there is a lot of space to develop new ideas um, so with CNNs and so on, um, there are limitations that make them not the best candidate for all type of problems. So yeah, so this is basically everything for this uh, for this work. Are there any questions or anything that is unclear? Anything that you'd like to discuss? Okay, I see no questions. So and now we have eleven twenty-five. Let us have. Yeah, so let's come back so at 11.40 to have our last uh, segment with a uh, quasi recurrent neural So here we'll be basically seeing uh, another idea where they say, we like what happens in RNS, but we don't like, um, yes, I, I, so actually I shared with Evgenia, so I don't know if she put this in Canvas, um, but I gave her the, the links. So uh, I, I will remind her, but I, I will expect that she is sharing them on Canvas, yes. And, but yeah, so the next thing I will discuss is this uh, quasi-recording RNS. That is a very nice idea. And also like another thing where you can think, if you are thinking about ideas for uh, developing new methods for sequences, this is something where there's a lot of potential to develop. So we'll, we'll discuss about it in a few minutes. So let's come back at 11.40, so in, in 40 minutes, uh, 14 minutes now, and discuss them all. So 11.40.
So we are back now. Um, yes, for the seminar video recordings, that's also that Evgenia should have access to because we're recording them. So they just need to put it online. Uh, but yeah, let, let's start with, the, with our second segment that is connected to what we discussed just now on uh, so WaveNet, dilated convolutions. Here the idea is, and let us take the general concepts of a recording neural network and try to model them as a CNN. Because so far we have said CNNs are great because they are much easier to, to implement and also to compute than uh, RNNs. Also, there is so much literature about them uh, that we can make use of. And uh, we can also try to have like tricks in order to how to simulate um, this uh, recurrency. And not only that, but also given that we can use tricks such as uh, the dilations, we can uh, consider uh, sequences that are uh, very long. And quasi recurrent neural networks is an idea that goes along these lines, um, but with a different angle. So here, the main motivator of the quasi recurrent neural network is how can we parallelize computing? Um, so we were saying that one of the challenge, uh, or so you see, for example, we are in Amazon and we have millions of time series for our products, is um, that we want that this to be fast. But also, of course, if we have access to a cluster of servers, then we can parallelize this computing. But as we'll see, this is something that we cannot really do it with an RNN, but we can do it with CNNs. And this is what motivates uh, to use these cross recording neural networks. So this is a publication from 2016. And uh, this is something that still has a lot of ideas that are very interesting and where there is potential also to uh, develop it further. So uh, I, I, I like this quite a lot, given that the concept is actually uh, very straightforward. It's very easy to understand. Um, but it, there are a lot of things that one can do with it. So <laughs> we know that the, so RNNs and LSTMs and so on, they, they are the standard, right? So for this classification, language modeling and so on. So we always use it. But if we think about working with GPUs, and we do not have the benefit of using uh, all our equipment in, especially we have multiple GPUs. So we can only work with one GPU in, in the RNNs. So the idea that cost recording neural networks is let us enable parallelization while getting a similar performance to, to the LSTM. And this is by the removing dependency in the hidden states. So we know that in the RNN, we have one state that is dependent of the previous one and so on. This is the idea of the recurrency. Um, but this, uh, this recurrency is what does not let the parallelization, um, given that we need always to have access to this previous state in order to compute the future state. So they, they, they say here, uh, so Bradbury says in, in what's recurring in our So let, let us basically uh, remove these dependencies and this way we can do this in parallel. So we summarize it. We want to do this computation in parallel. In RNNs, we cannot do it, but with CNs, we can do it. And the question is, okay, how then we will handle the, uh, the, the, the sequential dependencies, right? So given that we have an order and so on, and they propose to use pooling, which is a very cheap operation, it's very simple, and it's also very well studied. So this way, through a combination of convolutions and pooling, they can emulate the behavior of a RNN, get similar results to an RNN, but a fraction of the cost. So uh, it, sounds, it sounds very promising. And um, so the question would be why again is not a use everywhere? Why also in the year 2021, we do not really hear too much about quasi recurrent neural networks. And we'll discuss in a few minutes, why is that? So um, we start by again, reviewing that um, we have uh, our RNNs that is basically uh, these hidden states that we have across time and uh, consistent of an input and, and like the previous state. So therefore this means that if we want to compute the next hidden state, we need to know the previous hidden state. Whereas the CNNs, they work by applying this filter with this cost. So we say that we have a, so the, this, this, this filter is moving across the sequence. And this is basically the same filter across all inputs. So here we do not have any, any dependency in between the inputs and, and the outputs. So this enables the parallelization. But at the same time, we cannot work with the, the uh, hierarchy and the dependency of the sequence. 
right? So it's, it's a bit of a conundrum. And you might say, okay, how does that work in practice? Well, so for example, if we think about a sentence, so here, this movie is not a movie that you should watch with your family. And we see how the word not is essential for understanding the whole sentence. However, if we want to um, use a CNN, we we'll need to apply a filter to entire sequences. So these, to the, to the whole uh, sentence or sub-sentence, not a movie that you should watch with your family. And that means that we'll have so many parameters in order to be able to capture all this. And that means a lot of data, it will be complicated, right? So, so uh, we'll not be really able to, to, to do it. So how, how can we handle this? Well, what the current say is, okay, let us try to compute these hidden states. So they're not really hidden states in terms of, of like the RNN, but uh, the QRNNs try to emulate them. And then it will try to handle these dependencies in the pooling layer. So how does it look? You can see here this image, right? So where you can see here, where we have the, the LSTM on the left. I will see how the LSTM we have. Uh, so these blocks um, that we then pass through the recurrency. So and then in the recurrency we have uh, how we have uh, this dependency across them. And then we have again like the next output and then we pass it again through uh, the next uh, recurrency and so on. Whereas in the CNN is, uh, that there is not a dependency across time, but rather we're doing this. Um, so through the convolution, they are just filters. And what the QRN, QRNN is proposing, okay, so let us keep this a convolution and then let us have a, 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 this pooling filter that enables us to combine the different values of the convolution and then pass it again to the next convolution and so on. So this pooling layer in a sense tries to emulate uh, this recurrency in the LSTM. So, um, and, and the colors is just that the, the red means linear blocks and the blue one means element-wise blocks. So the, the pooling layer is tries to emulate these element-wise blocks. Uh, how, how can we do it? Or how does, does, does the quasi-recurrent network work in, in practice? Well, the quasi-recurrent network, what it does is, so for a given input, it generates a three outputs. And it is a, what they call a candidate vector, a forget gate and an output gate. So they are basically trying to emulate the, the LSTM. And you can see that uh, these uh, different uh, outputs is just the convolutions through different activation of functions. So here, this, uh, so one will be the, the hypertangent and then we'll have it here two, two sigmoids. But otherwise it will be basically the same. Uh, so convolution with different weight matrix. So what we're doing is we're supplying these convolutions to compute these intermediate vectors and these gating vectors. The idea is that we want to simulate the, the LSTM, but otherwise it's just a normal, normal, normal uh, convolution. There, there is nothing new here. What, what is like the, the innovation is on this pooling layer. So in, in the pooling layer, they, what they try to do is basically to um, try to do something that assimilates how it be for the LSTM. Um, but the difference is that uh, so here we are doing the, the computational in parallel, and then we just do a, a minimal processing in the pool layer, right? So, mm. and the, the other nice thing, of course, is that given that we were computing uh, these uh, inputs separately, so the uh, our candidate vector, the uh, this, um, so here is three the guide vector, the forget gate, and the output gate, they are not dependent on the previous values, right? So, and so you may be thinking, this is, this is, is this a bit strange, right? So how, how can we compute uh, the forget gate without knowing, so the hidden state, right? So how, how, how should we know what we should be forgetting if we don't know like the previous value? And um, the, the thing is that given that we're using, so here the, the pool layer, this is where we're taking the previous input into account. Um, so although the, uh, the values themselves, they are independent from each other, um, the forget gate is computed um, considering through the pool layer, so these, these inputs. Um, and this means that, that way we can determine which uh, 
inputs are not relevant. In this case, they only use uh, words. But of course, one can think about extending it. And, and I think I have seen works on the use uh, here quasi recurrent in real numbers for uh, time series. But in any case, so it basically can, given that it has this uh, forget gate, it can ignore certain inputs and so on. Mm. Then, given that there is this stacking, and um, we have again the situation of how do we uh, handle uh, so these very deep networks. Well, they also use skip connections here. So we can see that skip connection is something that you can use as a standard technique for your architectures, especially, uh, so here in sequences that we're saying, hey, we need a way to uh, handle these uh, strong hierarchies that will be very deep. But also in this case, they try other uh, variations of the architecture. Here you can see it on the right side where they include some attention layer. And what is happening here is that we see how we have um, our convolution, our pooling uh, layers. But then what happens is that the pooling layer will generate a, a new input that we can pass through a, a new, um, another set of, of layers and that are working in parallel. And we can pull this all in an attention layer in order to generate our final output. So uh, here we see, and we will study attention and so on more detail in the next weeks. But the idea here is just how can we work with the fact that, uh, so when we'll have like a very long sequence, we can think here that we'll split in subsequences. And then this left side will work with subsequence A and the right side will work with subsequence B. And how can we combine it again in order to generate our output? So for a very long sequence, it, well, we can use attention layer for, for, for this one. Although it's not necessary, so it's just like an additional improvement that they put into the architecture. But the main idea of the architecture is just let us combine the convolutions for each given input through this pooling layer. And this pooling layer is emulating our recurrence. And they, they do this for language tasks, right? So here, this works from 2016, as we were discussing in, in our uh, previous uh, session, uh, pretty much uh, the um, many foundational works that happen for uh, uh, LSTMs, RNNs, and so on, they came from the uh, NLP literature. And it is until relatively recent, let's say 2017, 2018, when people started to do techniques for neural forecasting. So that means that at that point in time, nobody was really trying to work with, with time series. And here we only have uh, sentences. And um, so here, like the main thing to highlight is uh, how it is uh, fast, right? So here we can see that um, it is basically um, a, significantly faster than a, an, an LSTM. And uh, if we look at the results, we see how the results, they are comparable to an LSTM. Uh, they are not exactly the same, still the LSTM uh, gets a better performance. But of course, the LSTM was significantly slower to compute. So um, here we see that um, the, the, they, they deliver very good results. And the question is, OK, so why, why are not we using them uh, for everything? And it's so simple. So, so just got these pull layers and so on. Um, but the reality is that these pulley layers, they're in a sense like a hack to have this recurrency. And they cannot, of course, emulate exactly what the, the recurrency is doing. So um, they will not, they will never perform as well as actually using an LSTM. So here we're saying, okay, we're trading certain accuracy. We're willing to take less accuracy into account for the benefit of being significantly faster to use a, a multiple GPUs and so on, and for working with very large data sets. So depending on your problem, this might be a trade-off that you want to consider. So if you were saying, hey, I have a millions of time series, and not only that, but also I have access to a cluster of many GPUs, and I need to basically compute a trend. So I do not know like the exact price for tomorrow's stocks, but I want rather to know if the price will go up or down, then something such as a quasi-recurrent neural network can be very attractive for you because you will be uh, getting good results for a fraction of the time required to compute them. Mm. And as we see, given that uh, this pool layer is not that good handle these dependencies, there is here a lot of space for uh, innovation. And this is an idea that is a bit forgotten, so it's always possible to 
bring back this idea and, and bring improvements. So here you see that they proposed a, a attention layer, but it was 2016. So by then uh, a lot of things have happened. So um, um, there are multiple versions of attention. So you can consider about uh, there is um, new innovations there, but also we can think about ideas regarding the dilated convolution and so on. We can think about uh, mixing the pool layer with dilation and so on. So definitely so an idea that is uh, very straightforward, but with a lot of potential. So are there any questions? Okay, I see, I see no questions. So we're pretty much finished. So just to recapitulate, so what we have learned today, we have learned that this idea that we need RNNs or just the idea of recurrency for sequential data is not correct. We can get as good results as a LSTM as an RNN with CNNs by just using small modifications uh, through uh, the CNNs. We have seen that CNNs have benefits, that they are easy to implement, they're fast to compute, we can parallelize them, but they have downsides. The downsides are on one side, given that we apply a filter everywhere to our input, we cannot uh, have this uh, different effect on, on the sequence of the, the hidden states that we have in, in an RNN. Also, we have the fact that in order to consider long sequences, we have to introduce uh, the dilations, and this means therefore that we need to stack them and that means that we need to introduce things such as this key connection and so on. Yeah? So mm, we see that the simplicity on one side is a benefit, but also is, is a negative side, especially working with a very long sequences. But nevertheless, we're seeing how um, the results can be competitive. And if we're working with very large data sets, it can be something very attractive, uh, either using uh, so a wave net or using quasi recurrent in the networks and so on. Mm, so if you're thinking about uh, your next architecture, do not discard working with um, CNNs. And in fact, just as, as last seminar, we discussed this work that shows that a very simple uh, one layer RNN can get as good results as a very much more complex architecture. There are also publications that show how using a one dimensional CNN, very basic uh, architecture, you can get comparable results to much more advanced ones. So uh, do not uh, discard this as a potential uh, baseline. And if not, or if you want to do more, then definitely CNNs for uh, time series forecasting for working in general with sequences is also a very promising area. So yeah, that's everything for today. And next week we'll continue uh, on, on Tuesday. I, I will then uh, share this material is already with Evgenia, so I already shared it with her yesterday. So she just needs to put it into uh, our canvas and also the same thing for the recordings. Yeah, and if not, uh, if you don't have any other questions, then uh, that's how we conclude for today. Then uh, yeah. we'll stop here our screen. And uh, we finish uh, on time pretty much. And I wish you a nice Friday. So have a nice day, everyone. Take care. Thank you, bye. Thank you.